So my name is Arvashi Chakravarti and I'm one of the local organisers for Race Before Race Genealogies along with Liza Blake, Liza Please Wave and um, our amazing conflict resistant Sim Ong. Sim, if you could please wave, thank you. Um, and we will be around and happy to help with any questions that come up um, or any uh, anything that you encounter, please feel free to get touch, in touch with one of us. So we are so grateful to uh, Dr. Akua Cooper for accepting our invitation to start things off. And we thank all of you for joining us, whether it's in person, uh, virtually, synchronously, or asynchronously. We'd like to begin by acknowledging this land on which the University of Toronto operates and where we're convening and learning today. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are deeply grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I'll reserve formal remarks and statements of thanks for tomorrow morning, but for now, please let me thank especially two institutions who have made this evening's events possible. The first is the Jackman Humanities Institute, um, who have um, provided wonderful support through a program for the arts grant. And secondly, St. Michael's College, who are generously hosting the opening reception at Father Madden Hall, um, immediately following our keynote. And we'll all walk over together so that no one gets left behind. For those of you listening and tweeting along, first of all, thank you so much. And um, the hashtag is R before R Toronto. So without further ado, I'll get to the main event of this evening. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce Professor Afua Cooper, whose work on African-Canadian studies and especially on enslavement and emancipation in 18th and 19th century Canada and the Black Atlantic has been so central to our understanding of Black Canadian history. She has written numerous books as well as several volumes of poetry and historical fiction, and her book, The Hanging of Angelique, is a groundbreaking work on Canadian slavery, and please do look for it in the digital book display where there's also a conference discount. Professor Cooper is the chair of the scholarly panel on Lord Dalhousie's relationship to race and slavery, and also co-author of the report. She founded the Black Canadian Studies Association, and she currently holds a Killam Research Chair at Dalhousie University, where she previously held the James Robinson, John, Robinson Johnston Chair. In addition, Professor Cooper was the seventh poet laureate of Halifax. She was a founder of the Canadian dub poetry movement. She has curated numerous exhibitions on enslavement and on the Underground Railroad, and she is Canada's representative on the UNESCO International Scientific Committee for the Slavery Project. And she was just awarded the J.B. Terrell Historical Medal from the Royal Society of Canada for outstanding work in the history of Canada. Please do join me in welcoming Professor Cooper. Thank you, Urvashi, for such a warm introduction. And further thanks for the invitation. I am truly honored to be your keynote presenter this evening. And thanks to all of everyone who's involved in the organizing of this conference and to the audience for coming out. Um, I came from Halifax today. I was in the, in the airplane <laughs> fleeing Hurricane Fiona. So I thought, oh, this invitation is so perfect because if it goes well for the hurricane, um, she will hit Nova Scotia, they say, Saturday morning between beginning at 2 a.m. and will last until 2 p.m. I suppose they know how to predict these things, but already the tide is high, it's windy, we have to remove all our patio furniture. We are urged to stock up and buy our flashlights and, um, and batteries. So 
the last hurricane we experienced that made landfall was Hurricane Dorian in 2019. Of course, so many people were without power, including myself. But it's the Atlantic and it's hurricane season. And I was keeping my fingers crossed. I'm saying it's September. We haven't had a hurricane. Um, <laughs> but here in September, the hurricane, the, the season is supposed to end in September. So I guess this is it. But now we know that hurricane season, um, lasts until November nowadays. So the global warming is real. And the hurricane has made landfall in the Caribbean. It, um, has hit Turks and Caicos. Um, devastated Puerto Rico, uh, made landfall in Dominican Republic. So it kind of went North Caribbean and then it's tracking its way up here, um, on the Canadian East Coast. Hurricane is an important feature of life in the Atlantic, especially in the Caribbean. The hurricane is a very smart entity. Um, you typically do not get hurricane, say, from Trinidad right down, from the tip of South America down. Um, it, it rises up from north of the equator and, and tracks north. It begins in the Atlantic, or the hurricane off the coast of West Africa, and some people say the hurricane is the revenge of the slave. Um, because when we think of the Middle Passage, the Atlantic, the piece of ocean from West Africa to these parts, to these Americas, that was a site of horror for enslaved people, people who were held captive in slave ship. So the Atlantic Ocean is, you know, it's a terrible ocean with respect to the history of black people, um, you know, historians tell us that at least two million could be more, I'm sure. Uh, the bones of two million people are at the bottom of that ocean. Um, so it's interesting that the hurricane rises there. Hurricane doesn't go the other way. It doesn't go to West Africa. It begins in the Atlantic and it tracks to the New World. Um, so there, uh, this, issue of um, global warming. When I was a kid growing up in Jamaica, we never witnessed hurricane. We were, you would hear on the radio or the television that there's a hurricane rising up in the Atlantic. And we we're like, yes, we want to see the hurricane. We've never seen a hurricane. And you know, our parents talk about how devastating. They talk about Hurricane Charlie, 1951, and the roof blew off and that kind of thing. And we wanted to witness that kind of devastation <laughs> as children. Then finally, 1979, Hurricane Allen made landfall. And we said, we do not want to see another hurricane because it was so um, devastating. But for, and this ties into my keynote, for countries in the Caribbean, hurricanes, when they make landfall, are particularly devastating. These are poor countries. Uh, most of them are post-colonies. Um, the road system is bad. You have, uh, you know, the roads are mashed up, landslides, mud fall. Um, and if you think about during the period of slavery, what, what that would have meant for enslaved people on these plantations whose homes were very um, fragile, you know, the slave huts built of straw or, you know, cast away wood, the homes where the ruling class lived, where the planters lived, tended to be sturdy, built of stone. So the hurricane, um, whilst it affected the topography and everyone in the territory, had a, a particular devastating impact on enslaved people. And today is the same. We witnessed Hurricane Rita in when it made landfall in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is still recovering from Rita, and now it's hit again. We saw how uh, Rita and Maria and those hurricanes devastated the island of um, Dominica uh, and Haiti and Cuba and everywhere else. Now mentioning Cuba, 
it's in the Caribbean, and not that Cuba isn't devastated by hurricanes. It is, but Cuba is a country that invests in its people and its infrastructure. So while uh, Cuba, Eastern Cuba, was devastated by Maria and Rita, or certainly impacted, at the same time, Cuba was sending medical and other forms of aid to Haiti and other countries in the Caribbean that were suffering from the, sea, from the impact of the same hurricane. So there's a difference in um, outcomes when you invest in people, when you invest in infrastructure, and a lot of these post-colonies uh, <laughs> Um, actually do not do that enough. We have just witnessed, some of us who watched it, the burial of Queen Elizabeth II, her funeral. Um, and there's something interesting going on. So the, the first countries, first world countries, I call them the hype countries, you know, they were able to bring their own cars and their own mode of transportation. And certainly Joe Biden was in his beast, that's what his car is called, the beast, which is kind of an ominous title, nonetheless. And then the countries in the third world, those leaders, they were all bust. They were all in a bus like school children. So I'm thinking, good for them. They shouldn't have gone. Uh, you, you couldn't tell Joe Biden to to ride in a bus to the funeral or the emperor of Japan. The emperor of Japan simply would not attend. Imagine the emperor of Japan in a bus, right? He has to have his, his car, his limousine. But it, it speaks to this arrangement. It speaks to the, the hierarchy in the world, the racial, especially the racial hierarchy um, in the, that's current right now that had its roots in, in the past, that had its roots in history, that had its roots in the history of colonization and slavery. So I'm gonna do this poem. It's called Woman a Wheel, talking about hurricane. I said which poem I'm gonna begin with, and I thought this one, because of the hurricane. Woman a wheel. The earth is in labor, 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 labor. Woman a well. hmm. Creation in danger, 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 danger. And what shall she bring forth from her travail? What shall she bring forth from her travail? Her mountain shall roar and spit fire, fire, fire. Her bowels shall move and cause the earth to split from one end to another. And our minds too shall be rent asunder. Mm -hmm. This woman shall avenge herself. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, but terrible as an army with banners. She wail and ball as she destroy, but she create again and again and again and again. She wail and shriek hi as she bring forth a new way of thinking a new way of living, a new understanding, and a new, 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 new creation. From the mouth of the Yangtze, from the throat of the Yangtze, from the mouth of the Ganges, from the heart of the Niger, from the belly of the Amazon, she dance. She danced down lightning and thunder. She danced down brimstone and fire, fire. She is a mighty earthquake. She is a non-stop hurricane. She dance and dance and dance, dancing the world. And oh, woman, a well. 
will she dance her dance of terror woman a will she dance her dance of fear look she dancing on the four winds dancing the world and oh woman a will the earth is in labor, 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 labor. Woman a whale, and what shall she bring forth from her travail? What shall she bring forth from her travail? A new way of thinking, a new way of looking, a new understanding, a new way of do things, a new way of sittings, and a new, 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 new creation, a new creation, a new creation. This, this one is um, called A World Greener Than Eden, subtitled, My Father Planted a Provision Ground. What is a provision ground? Does anyone know? When people say provision ground. Uh, where you grow yams and the sheen and um, root crops. It's a... Uh, it's a term used in the Caribbean. Um, and back to slavery, race before race. It wasn't the masters who, or the owners, or the enslavers who fed the slaves. The slaves fed themselves because they planted those provision grounds um, to provide sustenance for themselves. And that tradition, of course, a tradition that they brought from Africa, but the tradition continued post-slavery. So in rural Jamaica, even in urban spaces, but in rural Jamaica where I was born, um, everyone had a provision ground. Uh, you had your house and behind it or in front of it or beside it is a provision ground. And if you could afford to rent other lands, which my parents did, then they planted more food. So before my father was my grandfather, the two grandfathers, I didn't know them, they passed away before I was born, but they also planted provision ground. And we inherited the land I was born on and grew on was the um, home or land of my mother's father. And then my father who by trade was a mechanic but was also an agronomist, um, planted everything. My father planted a provision ground with yams of all sorts, yellow yam, white yam, negro yam, afu yam, lucy yam, even yampi, the small yams, and sweet potatoes with red skin, golden skin, white skin and pumpkins, squash, dasheen, badus, cocoa, cassava, cucumbers, and other root and vine crops. Congo peas, okras, plantains, and bananas. He planted breadfruit and ackee trees, and like the agronomist he was, crafted a tree that bore june plum, avocado, and jackfruit, at the same time. For the short term, dad planted a kalalu patch with bok choy, spinach, bell peppers, bird peppers, scotch bonnet, carrots, garlic, onion, scallion. My father always praised the soil. Decades before, my grandfather planted citrus groves with sweet orange, civil orange, tangerine, lime, and the startling lemon and grapefruit trees that every season bore so much that neighbors, friends, and passers-by invited themselves into our yard to partake. 
Grandfather also planted coconut trees, made his own oil and milk from the coconut flesh, grew sugar cane, had his own mill that pressed the juice from the cane, made wet sugar and molasses. Grandfather tended a cocoa walk from which he prepared chocolate to make hot cocoa drink, which he sweetened with wet sugar and flavored with coconut milk, nutmeg, and cinnamon powder for us. Grandfather also planted corn. These men built a well with a spout pointing in each of the four directions that carried water to irrigate the crops they planted. I guess it's a homage to my father and grandfather. And I was in Jamaica recently and had the great pleasure of walking some of those lands that these men planted um, and looking at some of the same trees. One of the things my father did um, when each of us was born, and there were nine of us, was to, to plant a tree. So as we were growing up, we knew that breadfruit tree is Carol's breadfruit tree. The Aki tree is a Foa's tree. <laughs> the jackfruit tree is Conrad's tree. And so there were all these trees in the yard that we knew um, which person it belonged to, or the banana walk, for example. Um, so this, you know, food is, is life, food is nutrition. And a, it, it's, I was born in a, a parish called Westmoreland, it's in the western side of Jamaica, as the name implies. Westmoreland was a sugar parish, so you have the the hills where we lived and where I was born, and then you had the plains, flat, flat land on which they grew sugarcane, which is still grow sugarcane. It's still a sugar, sugar parish. But um, in, in the mountains, in the backlands, was where enslaved people and later on freed black people would grow their crops to survive. So, you know, the parish I was born, Westmoreland, you can't go there or I can't go there and not think of, of the history of the, the maroon revolts, of um, walking through the sugarcane fields. For example, my primary school, which is called Petersfield Primary School, is literally built in the middle of a sugarcane estate. There it is, a school right in the middle. But, um, and so every day, you know, as a young child, we engage with history, me, my siblings, the other kids, without, without knowing that we were engaging with history. So now it's, it's so interesting going back for me and just walking on those roads, um, talking to the neighbors, looking at the landscape that my, um, a male, male ancestors that they, you know, crafted, that they shaped for us. This next poem is called The Child is Alive. And it was inspired by a film called Sankofa, which was um, made by Haile Gerima, an Ethiopian filmmaker from Washington, D.C. And there's a scene in the film in which an enslaved woman um, who was highly pregnant, uh, she runs away from slavery, but she was caught and returned, and her punishment was 100 lashes. And so she dies under the administration of the lash. And there was another woman who, who is a midwife, I imagine, who said, well, the woman is dead, let's save the child. And so I imagine the midwife woman to be connected to Nanny, Queen Nanny of the Jamaican Maroons, who she was an 18th century freedom fighter that um, went to war with the British in 1733. But in addition to being a leader, a queen, a military strategist, she was also a midwife and a, and a doctoress or a herbalist. And a niece of Granny Nanny, 
and a can woman, a woman who can see far, a woman with the knowledge of herbs, a woman who works in the field cutting cane, a woman who speaks the language of her grandmothers, a woman who tells stories of magical animals and of talking trees and of fabled cities beneath mighty rivers, a woman who was stolen from her village when she was 14, a woman who was raped on the ship by white sailors, a woman who flies to Africa when she sleeps. This woman, this niece of Granny Nanny, takes her cutlass and runs with the swiftness of Sogolong Conde in her guise as Buffalo Woman, this woman runs with her machete, an ancient chant rising from her lips, an ancient chant imploring the gods and all the spirits that attend women in childbirth to come to her aid. She calls her companions, form a circle around the dead woman, breathe, breathe, give her breath, give her life. This woman, this niece of Granny Nani, enters the circle and with her cutlass, the ancient chant leaping from her lips, cuts open the belly of the dead woman and releases the child. Oh, praise to God, she said, the child is alive. O Onyame, take the spirit of the mother. In the midst of misery and pain, in the midst of this humiliation and grief, in the midst of this inhumanity, praises, praises, praises. Our world is turned upside down. Day becomes night and night becomes day and the dead is given birth to the living. This woman, this niece of Granny Nanny, this ancient midwife, dances with the child forward, backward, sideward, spins and joins her companions, dancing like the priestess she would have been had not slavers stolen her away from her people. The woman dances east, west, north, south, holds the child up to the skies, blessings. Oh, praise to Onyame, the child lives. Oh, Onyame, take the spirit of the mother. Oh, praises, praises, praises. The child is alive. Why? 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 The child lives. So one question I'd like you to ask is, why would they want the child to live in the midst of misery and pain? Day becomes night and night becomes day and the dead is given birth to the living. That is the question. Because the child undoubtedly will, well, not undoubtedly, more than likely, will live a life of bondage. But the child lived, and it's not simply a fabrication of Haile Gerima's, you know, imagination. Things like that did happen. I mean, one of the ways in which enslavers, if a pregnant woman um, was disobedient or whichever word you wanna use, and they wanted to punish her, they would dig a hole in the ground, put her belly she, in the ground to protect the child and then whip her on the back. But of course the child is feeling that trauma and that terror and that brutality. Well, enslavers were hell bent on protecting their property. So even if the mother should die, then chances are the child could have died too, but chances are not, that it's not, they would have the child. So there's so um, 
all kinds of brutality that were meted out on the bodies of black people during this um, period. And that's one of the issues that was raised during this whole um, burial of Queen Elizabeth. I myself, I was asked by media to give interviews and I, I simply declined. I'm like, no, no interview. Not giving any interview to CBC. <laughs> I'm by myself. I don't have a bodyguard. Um, and you, because, you know, August 1st, I gave an interview on emancipation, about emancipation, the CBC. CBC ran it, it was eight minutes, and the hate mail that ensued. People even wrote me, it wasn't enough to, you know, to put your comments there on the website. People actually took the time and wrote me letters, sent it to my mailbox at Dalhousie University to make sure. So I'm thinking, damn. Uh, my, my thoughts are going to be strong on Elizabeth, so I better not. <laughs> you know, and I said to the journalist, I'm sorry, and here's why. But it was kind of sad because we think we have academic freedom, but in the, in this whole celebration, we were told that we should mourn, how long we should mourn. Um, and then there are some people are saying, well, we don't want to mourn, but you couldn't say it. It's like, mourn, 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 and here's why. And so I'm thinking, so what happened to EDI? That must be false, because, <laughs> you know, I have my right as a human being not to mourn. I have my right to say that the British underdeveloped Jamaica, and, and you know, when they left in 1962, whatever they left, we had to pay for, <laughs> you know, had to pay for. Can you imagine? You colonize a place for 300 years and when you're leaving, you say, you have to pay for that building, pay for that, you know. And my parents' generation, they only got education up to grade eight, enough so they could mark their name, write their names on the contracts that they would have to sign as laborers. And then here I am, I have to mourn. So it's, it's kind of violence. It was violent, this whole thing for me. So I just kind of went underground. So you may have heard of the film. You may even have seen it at the festival, the film called The Woman King, about the um, women soldiers in the kingdom of Dahomey, which is now the Republic of Benin. Um, you know, a lot of, some people, I wouldn't say a lot, some people are upset because they say, oh, they didn't do it right. They <laughs> misrepresented. I'm thinking, well, it's not really history. They are fictionalized, um, you know, the whole thing. And let Viola De um, Davis has her glory. I mean, when was the last time you see a, a dark-skinned black woman in a lead role kicking ass, right? So, but Dahomey is important, or Benin, Dahomey gave voodoo to the world, gave voodoo to Haiti. Voodoo is the official religion of the Republic of Benin, old Dahomey. And so Dahomey is, is kind of in our consciousness, in our psyche, as places where kick-ass women are from, and, um, and and women who are wise and smart. So one, one day I had this dream, or maybe it was a night, must have been night. It's called Firewoman 2. Old women, perhaps from the home, crept in my house dressed in robes of crimson and breathed upon me their breath of fire. They took charge of my house, painted its walls red, this caused the unwanted occupants to flee. Then they gave me a fire bath, said it would make me invincible. For my sustenance, they fed me grapes from Mary's vineyard, the juice of which warmed my blood and caused me to utter in scarlet tongues. For my birthday, they gave me live coals, then changed my name to Ruby. So these were the old women from Dahomey, but 
you know, Demeter may, uh, and Isis also made their appearance in that poem. I'm gonna read one called Child of Mine, and it's my excursion through the Book of Negroes. The Book of Negroes is a military register uh, that Guy Carlton, who was the com commander of the British forces in North America um, after the American Revolution. Well, he was during the revolution. But when the revolution ended, he um, instructed that black, the black people who gathered at New York Harbor throughout 1783, that their names be entered in a military register because they were going to be sent to British colonies. Now these black people had fought for the British during the Revolutionary War and the British lost the war and made good on some of their promises to transport these people to, to colonies. So many of them came to Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Some went to Bahamas, Trinidad, Jamaica, the UK, France, even Germany, because there were German mercenaries who fought for the British in the war. And when they, those who returned to Germany, but, you know, spending seven years in the colonies, they became slaveholders. So they took their slaves with them on returning to Germany, but they were children, these people, Many children were born behind the lines, the British lines. And um, so sometimes they didn't list the names of these children. It would be, okay, child of Uvarshi, you know, child of Habiba, because perhaps the scribe was tired. I imagine there, was, there were several scribes or they just couldn't be bothered. The child could have been young. So I just sort of went through the register. I just noted the name, well, not the names, but the children who belong to whomever. Um, and I wondered about them, child of Venus. So some black loyalist infants and babies listed in General Guy Carlton's Book of Negroes, 1783. So this is another way that poetry is fun. Okay, you can write poems, you know, from things like these. Child of Venus, child of Sarah, child of Dinah, child of Hagar, child of Chloe, child of Peggy, child of Patty, child of Thomas, child of Betsy, child of Mary, child of Guinea, child of Few, child of Prince, child of Abigail, child of Warner, Child of Cooper, child of Allen, child of Violet, child of David, child of Westcott, child of Willoughby, child of Effie, child of Caesar, child of Century, child of Isabella, child of Lucinda, child of Jupiter, child of Gambia, child of Campbell, child of Johnson, child of Watson, child of Williams, child of Bing, child of Tynes, oh dear sweet baby child of mine. How much time do I have left? Ten minutes, okay, thank you. So I'm gonna do this um, poem. It's called, I Breathe Breath Into Him. It's a meditation. It's more than a meditation. <laughs> kind of like an outrage. On um, the murder of George Floyd. So this is an, um, an homage to George Floyd. So if we think of that woman on the plantation who was beaten to death, pregnant, let's say that was 1784, a lot happening in the Atlantic world in 1784, the woman beaten to death, then we have these children boarding ships 
at New York Harbor, hopefully for a free life. And then in 2020, here we have George Floyd and others like him. So I link him to Emmett Till, Emmett Till, the kid who was murdered in 1955. And his mother, Emmett Till's mother, is called Mamie Till. Mamie Till said she had an open casket for her child, Emmett, the 14-year-old boy who was murdered in Mississippi by white men in 1955. She had an open casket because she wanted the world to see what they had done to her beautiful son. Emmett's face twisted his body disfigured. My son is a sacrificial lamb. And along the way, there were so many like him, like Emmett, Patrice Lumumba, Amilcar Cabral, Amadou Jallo, Sandra Bland, Junior Alexander Manon, Anthony Griffin, Friend Hampton, and now you, George Floyd, African lion from Mampruse land, great great grandchild of Sonin K, running from the cotton fields of the south to the ice flows of Minneapolis, wailing shall be in the streets. Sound the Nyabingi drum, sound the morning drum, wailing shall be in these streets. Throw the ashes on our heads as we clothe ourselves in sackcloth. Mothers, tie your belly with the morning cloth. Woman, burn your belly and ball. Woman, well. Weep in a loud voice. I say, wailing shall be in the streets. Ball, Mamie Till, ball, wail, beat the drums of sorrow, doom, 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 wail, our elephant has fallen, receive your son, O oh God, broadcast the message and the talking drum to the four corners of the earth, sound the abeng, blow the conch shell, wail, woman, and wail. The Quran 15 verse 29 says, I fashioned him and breathed my spirit into him. And Genesis 2 7 says, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and made him a living being. So breathe, George Floyd. Breathe, my brother. Breathe, George Floyd. Breathe. God made you a living being when he breathed his spirit into you. Breathe, George Floyd. Breathe. Rise. Rise, George. Rise. This one is called Rara, and it, I guess it sums up everything I've been saying. But it's a happy point. It's a world carnival. I witnessed carnival on the island of Martinique, and there were lots of Rara bands, R-A-R-A -R -A bands, which came from Dahomey, um, you know, popularized in the Western world by, by the people of Haiti. Rara bands are mu musical bands, but they enact all kinds of stories. So um, whatever the story is, uh, the Colombian landing in Hispaniola could be a story. The Haitian Revolution could be a story. So the beat drums, there are, there's painting, there's artwork. It's amazing. So there were all these Rara bands on the island. They seem to have taken over the island of Martinique. Rara bands came from Haiti. There were bands indigenous to Martinique. There were Rara bands from Panama and Miami and New York. 
It was great. So as you know, all these Caribbean islands places were firstly populated by the indigenous Tainos and Caribs, um, most of whom became decimated during the Spanish era, and then the English, and then the Dutch. I mean, the people of Martinique fought many, many wars with the French, um, both the, the Taino people and the African people on these, on these islands. And when you go to Martinique, the capital, Fort de France, there's a park called the Savannah, which is a savanna, big flat park, and they have statues all around the park. And there's a statue of Desnambouk, who was a colonizer who waged several wars with the Taino and with the Carib people from the neighboring island of Dominica. So he's there, but there's also a statue of Napoleon's wife, Josephine, Josephine Bonaparte, but she has been beheaded since 1973, but they have the headless statue still at the savannah with blood dripping at the neck. Of course, it's paint. And um, it's, it's kind of bizarre because I'm saying, well, why don't they just take down Josephine? But it's still there. Josephine and her husband, um, Napoleon, reinstated slavery on Haiti, on the, on the island, or tried to on Haiti, but reinstated it in Martinique. Or, you know, so that's one of the reasons. When you talk to people, they'll say, Oh yeah, Josephine was an enslaver. She reinstated slavery. We don't like her. What? What? What is this I hear? A thousand drums playing. Ratatatatat, 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 and Max Roach conducting. Ratatam tam 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 tam. Trap drums, djembes, and congos, and the voices of a thousand archangels chanting into the wind. Ra 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 ra. The drums scream the name of the home. But this is Fort de France. Dahomey is on the other side of the ocean. What is this I hear? Rara drums awakening the city. A dog howls. I look through the window. He dives into the sea and disappears while swimming to the other side of the harbor. A cock. It's circadian clock, recalibrated, crows at 15 minutes to midday. Ra ra, rhythms have remade the world. But this is not Haiti. How come these Rara people are marching all over Fort de France, sending vibrations into the earth, the air, and the sky, answering secret rhythms with sacred rhythms? I am sure they are not mortal beings, but a celestial horde on the march with Babatunde Olatunji. The sound of trap drums, sa sa ye, sa sa ye in up to the hills, to Montartenson, to Trenel, even up to the Balata Road, way past Tivoli, to the volcano named Montpellier. And from the peak of the hill, the drummers and trumpeters look down onto the harbor, look way past the horizon, and beat their thoughts onto the air, sending back the colonizer and Indian killer Desnambouk to the deepest dungeon of France, recrowning Chateauier, the Carib king, beating the martial rhythms for triumphant Kalinago warriors, reversing the slave trade, stitching whole again, Africa. And in the distance, from the direction of Lamanta, I hear the pounding of hooves, doom, 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 doom. The earth trembles in unexpected bliss. I see clouds of brown dust spiraling into the sky. I feel the hot breath of panting steeds rushing toward the city. Somewhere there is a clash of cymbals, a gate opens, mounted men holding a landscape of Osafa flags rush through. Sparks of fire rise from the horses' hooves. What is this? The cavalry? 
led by the fugitive slave named Matthew Leveille, from the savannah, the drummers advance, beating on a thousand drums, blowing on horns and trumpets, bamboo sticks, maracas, shak, 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 shak. African captives chained at the bottom of slave ship, drowned in the shipwreck at Anse Kafar, and from the volcano at Montpellier. Oh, I hear them weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth, a fury of chains clanking as a ship crashed on the rocks and sank to the bottom of the sea. Somber ghosts stand on the beach, look across the ocean, take us back to Benin, take us back to Benin. Now they walk across the landscape at Diamond Rock, beating their chest and chanting a salt water dirge. Ra ra from Dahomey, ra ra from Haiti, ra ra in Fort de France, ra ra blowing onto the Caribbean Sea towards Saint Lucie and La Dominique, way up to Les Îles de Vierge and down to the tip of Venezuela, creating this archipelago of rhythms. And then a boy, 14 years old, pierces the air with the fury from his trumpet, and suddenly the cacique Bohichio stirs from his sleep, rubs his eyes, grabs his conch shell, and blows a message to Hatoui over in Cuba, and in Haiti to Louverture, Desaline, Christophe, Cecile, Fatima, and Huracan, the god of thunder, blows his breath over the sea. Hurricane a come, hurricane a come, uno better run, hurricane a come. Meanwhile, Queen Anacaona, Empress of Hispaniola, stands on the tallest point of Haiti and begins to whirlwind a final dance for independence. Ra, 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 to ra. Thank you. So we hope that you might be willing to enter into conversation with us. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you just raise your hand, I will get the microphone to you as quickly as possible. Um, thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Cooper. That was uh, uh, breathtaking, and um, I was really struck by the tenderness of your child of mine poem. Um, and I guess my question is, also in response to your question of why, why would they want the child to live in these circumstances? And I, it made me wonder, like, how how do you find that tenderness or how do you or what does even just what does tenderness mean to you uh, searching for tenderness in these in these histories thank you i think it is uh, the tenderness comes from you know sometimes the immediacy of the situation not, not with the baby being delivered, not that scenario. Even though there is tenderness there, I mean, the midwife could have killed a child, but she didn't. It's, so there's immediacy of the situation and just looking at this child and seeing the beauty and seeing the possibility. 
and also uh, in, in a way seeing the future. So people live in and you're hoping that they will continue this, the, the struggle for freedom. So, you know, that child could have been to Saint Louis Tour. Who knows, right? Um, or the children on, on the ship, you know, the child of Vanessa or the child of Venus. Uh, who, who are these children? So I think of that and I, I get really tender. Um, in my heart, because who, who are these children? And what will become, of, or, or what became of them? You know, it's like over 200 years now. They, they certainly did something in life. But also in Guy Carlton's book, there were children who, who boarded the ships who had no parents. There was a list of children who, who were unaccompanied by parents. So one over here, boys over here, girls, and they're, age, some of them were babies too, 18 months. I'm thinking, what? You know, so this is where the imagination comes in. 18 months, what happened to her parents? Maybe they died, maybe they're on another ship, maybe they, who knows, right? And so you try to think and create a life for those orphan children. And, um, and you know, or someone like Phyllis Wheatley. They could have ended up like, you know, Phyllis Wheatley in her genius. Who knows? So that's where the tenderness comes in, in imagining a sort of a bright future for them in the midst of the present that wasn't so bright. Hello. We came in together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know in whose presence I was when I came in. Um, I wanted to ask a real follow up on this question about imagination. Um, so I guess it sort of has two parts. Um, what is the role in your opinion of imagination for a historian, especially a historian of the African diaspora? Um, how does imagination, creativity, performance, heart, you know, all of the things that you showed us actually uh, influence the way that you do history, one. And then two, what is the place of imagination, creativity, heart, all of that um, in history as it's received by an audience? Yes. Thank you. So maybe I, I could go to the second part of the question, uh, how it's received by the audience. So I'm thinking or I'm hoping that the audience can, can grasp a great vision and um, not that we are trying to run away from r reality, but we, we do create our own realities, right? It's pe people made a decision. I was, the, the, the slave trade broke the world, right? The slave trade broke Africa. It also broke Europe because Europe trampled on its own morality because of greed, right? Just to, to be wealthy. So it broke them too. So in that sense, I'm saying we create our own reality. But it's, it's for us to, to come to a, a, large, a larger vision, um, to think who was it who said something greater than ourselves, that if we believe in humanity, if we believe in the beauty of life, which I do, then I'm, I'm hoping that when I'm up here and I'm reading these poems, that um, people's imagination can can be ignited. We don't we don't do a poem, you know, like the George Floyd George Floyd poem and talking about Emmett Till. Emmett Till is it's an awful awful story. I teach a course on the civil rights, and you know, I sometimes I, I really can't do Emmett Till. He's fourteen years old, right? He's the only child of his mother. And, but we, we have to do Emmett Till. And 
we have to watch the videos. We have to come back and discuss it because it's important, even though there were so many people, so many men like Emmett Till, thousands like Emmett Till, but we know his story. There's a, there's a story, right? Um, we are called upon to be greater than who we are. That's, that's it. To not shrink back in ourselves and in our lives and, and move on. So that's a partial answer to the second part. To the first part, how historians are, we, we want to have facts, we want to be sure. Historians are also insecure, right? <laughs> you go to a conference and you, you give your paper and then someone in the audience said, oh, that was wrong. <laughs> it was not 1784, it was 1786. <laughs> and um, your interpretation is off. And you only tell a part of the story. <laughs> so I've, I've let go of my insecurity. Um, so, you know, we, we want to have the facts. And when we don't, we, we, we say, okay, maybe, perhaps, maybe, uh, you know, we use that kind of language. But I'm also a poet, thanks to my grandmother growing up in rural Jamaica. Thanks to my primary school teachers where every Friday we had to do poetry, right? We had to write poetry and it had to rhyme. Um, and so what I cannot pin down in, in terms of facts, I engage the imagination, but there's a lot of facts in my poetry, right? Emmett Till was real. George Floyd was murdered. Um, well, I don't know if George Floyd is from the Soninke tribe, but I made him a Soninke. Soninke is a great African nation, right? And you look at George Floyd, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, whoa, he could be a Soninke. And in the whole African tradition, when a great person dies, or when anybody dies, it doesn't have to be a great person, and, and they send out the message on the talking drum. And when you listen, uh, because the talking drum, the tones and the patterns um, replicates the, the spoken language. And then they'll say something like, an elephant has fallen. The elephant has fallen. So you know that the chief has died or the queen mother has died because these people are elephants. So I bring all of that to the poem in honor of this man. Sound the talking drum. The elephant has fallen, right? Um, not to say, you know, this man was murdered by that bastard, Derek Chauvin. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> look at the other side. So in both cases, I'm putting the history with the imagination or the facts with the imagination. This is who he could have been, right? He's Soninke, he's a Khan. He's not just some guy from Minneapolis. This is his lineage. We might have time for one more question. So bring us home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for everything you shared tonight. I'm also from a rural community in Jamaica, so everything resonated. You know, all the Which parish? St. Catherine. Okay. Near Linston Market. Okay. Yes, Famous yes. market. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm wondering your thoughts about um, what you think the the West African spiritual energy that you touched on so deeply tonight, how that can help us in uh, our anti-racism and racial equity work. Uh, I'm an anti-racism policy advisor, and I look to that part of my ancestry as well to to you know help me to bring forward the messages that will help us in the here and now. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. I think it's acknowledging the aspect of her, of her being. Oftentimes when we go into these spaces, whatever it is, we kind of, um, we, we kind of erase ourselves. We silence ourselves. We go with the mainstream, whatever. And the mainstream could be what's taking place in EDI and feminism. And we, we kind of think, oh, what we bring is, isn't really that enough, or spirituality, or epistemology sort of thing. We have our ep epistemologies, we have our ways of doing things, which is as valid um, 
as the ways that are, are presented to us. So the, the spirituality for me is also about the everyday. It's how, you know, things, so how, how your grandmother uh, behaves and how she, <laughs> how she, uh, Oh, she would sit on the stoop of her house and look on the street and could really tell you the story of what's going on and the people who are passing by and, um, and, and teaching. She's, she's also teaching, right? So, so that's part of it, her way of doing things and, and how people, like when I was growing up in Jamaica, you couldn't, you, not that you couldn't. But you did. But they said when sunset when sunset comes, you must cover your head. They said even if you wear a baseball hat or a beret, cover your head, because the spirits come out at sunset, right? And and there's a, a place here I forgot the name of it, Fontanelle, I think, that the spirits can enter. So from we're tiny, we we know that. So that's from you know West African tradition. It's also from the Islamic tradition. Right, the you know at 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 sunset at Maghreb, it's a whole energy that's out there, right? And they said if you could see, there are certain things you wouldn't do. I remember one time one of my cousins came home late. This was not in the country; it was in the city. It was late. It was maybe two o'clock in the morning or three a.m. She had gone to a dance. And she had this uh, kind of code between she and I. She was much older than I. Well, she would come and she'd knock at the window and I would get up and open the door. And this night she came, she knocked and I, and my aunt said, don't move. Don't open that door. <laughs> so I didn't open that door. So the morning came and my cousin was out. She was sitting out in the yard under the tree, she was just sitting there and my aunt got up and she just, even before she spoke to my cousin, she started singing. She went and she got some water and she threw it around the house. And when she did that cleansing, she said to my cousin, you brought so much spirit with you last night, right? So when she said to me, don't open that door, it was like I would have let in the spirits. And she said they weren't good spirits. She was coming from a dance, right? There are all these disembodied people who are looking to attach themselves to other people. Um, and so when we think about men mental health, we often don't bring our epistemologies to, to mental health, especially with regards to black people. But there, there's a whole way of doing things, a whole set of knowledge that's from the Caribbean and other places and from Africa that we, we, we have lost. So it is to just acknowledge that, it's to acknowledge your histories, it's to acknowledge your heritage, it's to acknowledge that there are other ways of doing things that are valid and it's not just this one track way. You're welcome. And if you could all please, um, if you could all please join me in just um, thanking Professor Cooper one final time. Thank you so much for. Your <laughs>